Let's talk about the big picture of construction layout. The purpose of construction layout is to transfer reference points and alignment from design drawings to the site to enable construction. Design drawings show the contractor what is intended to be built. However, when the contractor shows up on a blank site without reference points, and reference alignments provided for them, knowing where to start can be a great mystery. And that's where the surveyor comes in. How do we do this? We start by measuring from known points. Where do these known points come from? In most cases, they were set by the surveyors who came before design. They established control points reference points from which they mapped the site in such detail that the designers could make important design decisions. Well, they usually set those in protected or out-of-the-way places. Thus, the folks that start the construction layout start from those very same points because they are typically shown on the construction plans. So we measure from those known points to set stakes and nails at key geometry points like center lines or offset points. Then we establish elevations and the locations of those points relative to the proposed construction. We use survey stakes to hold information. They come in a variety of sizes and shapes. The short ones are often called hubs. Now, I've asked other older surveyors, why do we call them hubs? And I never have gotten a straight answer other than it is tradition. We can use these to mark horizontal positions and vertical positions. The tall, thin stakes are often called guard stakes in other countries. We simply refer to them as lath. These provide us a way to label the survey point. I think of them as the surveyor's post-it note. In fact, they can hold quite a bit of information. This particular example here shows the three-dimensional coordinates of a survey project for a gas pipeline. You can see that it's giving a northing, an easting, and an elevation. Any mark we make, whether it be a hub or a lath or some other type of mark, needs to be solid. They need to be driven firmly to ensure that they are stable. In fact, sometimes we can drive nails in asphalt paving. We can also set nails like that in concrete if we pre-drill a hole. Any point or reference line has to be durable that is, it needs to be marked with sufficient permanence. And we need to put it in a place that will maximize the longevity for the purpose of our project. If the project is only going to last a few weeks, a wooden stake may be sufficient to locate a horizontal reference point. However, if our project is going to last several months to a few years, we may set points in the ground using iron rods. Reference points need to be understandable by the user. The information that you write on your stakes needs to be understandable by the contractor who will use that information. And of course, our reference points need to be accurate sufficiently accurate for the intended use. A survey point that we use to control rough grading, if it has an accuracy of a tenth of a foot vertically, that may be adequate. However, if we are establishing a new benchmark that is going to be used by many people for many projects over several years, we're going to work to ensure accuracy at least to the nearest hundredth of a foot vertically. Construction layout invites high risk. When we build some kind of improvement, some type of construction from erroneous layout, we can incur the cost of some costly repairs.
any technician doing construction layout has to anticipate error sources. They have to anticipate all the possible ways that a blunder could be made or that a systematic or random error could invalidate their data. Therefore, the technician must check all work very rigorously. That means taking extra measurements to verify that the work is correct, taking time to check the field notes, to double check all the computations. It's when we are in a hurry that we make the most costly mistakes. Construction job sites are inherently dangerous places. To be doing construction layout in which mistakes are possible and to be doing it in dangerous conditions is certainly a high risk, not only financially but professionally, to the folks that do that kind of work. Construction layout requires a good bit of skill. The technician doing construction layout needs to understand how the contractor will use the laid out points and lines. Make sure to be very observant whenever you're on the job site and pay close attention to how the contractor uses the information from the stakes that you have already set. It will guide you in understanding how your future work will affect their work. The technician doing construction layout needs to communicate very clearly and proactively. On your first visit to the job site, you must first meet with the person who has requested your services and simply ask, what do you want me to lay out? Take time to go through the plans carefully with the contractor and then ask, how do you want me to mark it? The construction layout technician must be able to read construction plans very proficiently. In other words, you need to be able to visualize the proposed work in three dimensions merely by reading and interpreting carefully the two-dimensional plans. The contractor will rely upon your skill to communicate not only to the foreman or superintendent, but to the craftsman what must be done from your stakes. Let's consider here a classic layout error. In this case you have a building footprint in the heavy black line that needs to be laid out in this lot on a cul-de-sac in a residential subdivision. In this scenario, it's fairly typical with a pie-shaped lot like this to minimize the front yard and thus maximize the backyard. The dash lines that you see are setback lines and those are often shown on the subdivision plans and they are specified by the city where the subdivision is being built. Now what's critical in this case as we try to put this building as far forward in the lot as possible is the side yard setback. Many contractors will avoid trying to lay this structure out themselves because of the risk of getting it wrong. You see if they get the, the front corner, the one closest to the street in the right place, but they get the building rotated just a little bit they can end up with an encroachment in the opposite side yard. This can lead to very expensive modifications to the building and in some cases very expensive legal actions. Therefore, complex layouts like this often get contracted out to land surveyors. Well, so let's think about a typical building layout scenario. We've laid out the building roughly, and then we've started to dig the hole. Well, we've got this hole ready, but where in the hole does the building go? Here is a site for a large commercial building on the University of Illinois campus. Well, if we put layout marks down inside this excavation indicating the wall lines, they're likely to be damaged by activity on the site. So instead of putting them inside the excavation, we use offset points. These offset points enable layout for digging and structure work without interfering. This is the same site 
on the very same day and you can see the crew is setting forms for foundation walls. Well, how are they lining these up? Imagine from the photographer's perspective, behind the photographer in the street, there is a point that establishes one end of the wall line that they are setting forms against. On the opposite side of the site, near the building in the background, you will find another point that forms the other end of that line. So the points that establish these lines are actually set outside the excavation. Here's an example of how we do this on simple structures. When we are laying out a simple house structure, one way of doing this is to use a set of batter boards. Stretched between the batter boards are string lines, and those string lines cross over the four stakes that form the four corners of this simple structure. This shows a close-up view of the batter boards holding points that are offset beyond the corner of the structure. Here's a real-world picture. The single stake with orange ribbon represents the building corner, but when we excavate for the foundation, that corner will be obliterated. But if the batter boards are outside the excavation, then they will still be preserved throughout the duration of the project. So let's consider how we would set batter boards for this building. We'll assume that north is at the top of the image here. So we have three north-south lines and we have three east-west lines that we need to mark with offsets beyond the limits of our excavation. So let's start with the corners. Here, here's my north-south lines. You can see I've got offset stakes there off of those corners. And on my east-west lines, I've got offset stakes set here. We typically set these at a consistent offset distance. That might be 10 feet or 15 or 20 feet as needed. Well, so we've got this inside corner and we don't have any stakes for it. So if I set two stakes here, I'm really kind of fooling myself as to whether they'll do any good. You see, the excavation limits are intended to be between the offset stakes and the building. Well, now these two stakes will be wholly inside the excavation and thus once we dig the hole, they're gone and I don't have a way to reestablish those stakes or the corner that they represent. So instead of setting them inside the excavation, what we'll really do is extend them beyond the far side of the excavation, as you can see at these two locations. Let's say we have this building. Oh, we've got several corners there now, don't we? It looks like we have about 12 corners. So that would be a lot of stakes. And the more stakes we have on a construction site, the more likely they are to get in somebody's way, uh, whether that's with heavy equipment or vehicles or the actual work itself. And if they get in the way, they can often be destroyed and we've set them for no good reason or we have to reset them. So here's what it would look like if we staked every one of these corners with offsets. That's really too many stakes to be practical. So what we will often do at the request of the contractor, we will stake what we call the minimum rectangle. That is, we will stake offsets for four corners of the smallest rectangle that completely encompasses the building footprint. Really, that rectangle is defined this way. You can see the on the southeast corner of the building, the 36.65 foot side and the 108.40 foot side form one corner of the rectangle. And at the northwest corner, 
The two sides are 105.53 by 47.43. Those define the northwest and southeast corners. And then we can extend those lines up as parallel lines that you see marked in red here. This way, we have stakes that are more out of the way of the contractor's activities. And they don't have to try to dodge so many stakes during excavation and material delivery and the actual work on the building itself. When we lay this out, we need to perform independent checks to verify that we have done it properly. One of the great risks is that our corners aren't square. We can calculate the diagonals of this minimum rectangle by first summing up the lengths that will give us the sides of our rectangle. And then we're going to use Pythagorean theorem to calculate the distance from the northeast corner to the southwest corner and then from the southeast corner to the northwest corner. And you can see Pythagorean theorem uh, gives us that diagonal that we have called D. Using these data, we get 189.26 feet. In a perfect world, those diagonals should both measure 189.26 feet. If they are significantly different, more than say one hundredth of a foot or two, then we would have to do some investigative work to figure out where we've had some kind of blunder or inaccuracy. Well, if these are the building corners, that's one check we can make, but really once the hole has been excavated for the foundation, those corners no longer exist and our contractor is reliant upon our offset stakes. So therefore, we need to check diagonals between our offset stakes, don't we? So here I'm giving you a typical scenario in the blue box. You can see we've said that our offset that is the distance from the building corner to our stakes is set to be 15 feet typical for this project. What was 141.43 between the building corners, now we've added two 15 foot offsets to it across the bottom of the triangle. But our 125.76 distance is still the same because those offset stakes are in line with the east-west lines of this structure. Well, then when we apply Pythagorean theorem, we'll get a different distance. We don't want to do this for just a few stakes. We want to do it for as many as we can. So there are several different diagonals we would check. Here is another one. So notice, instead of 171.43, now we have 156.43. And instead of uh, 125.76, now we have 140.76. Why? Because the offsets affect our triangle differently in this configuration. So it's very, very important that whenever we do construction layout, that we do very careful and independent checks. We have to anticipate that we can make mistakes. Construction layout certainly invites high risk. If the improvements that we are laying out are built from erroneous layout, there can be costly repairs. And if the surveyor was at fault, then the surveyor is the one that pays. So technicians have to anticipate error sources. Learn to check your work very rigorously, not only the measurement, but also the computations.